Good morning, everyone. And as Helen just alluded to, I've talked about this before. This is not the first time. But what I really want to do is uh, tell you some different stories about Salmonella enteritis and really the progress that we're making uh, related to some of our whole genome sequencing. So this is a very crude way of showing you where we were up until about 2016. And this is kind of what we talked about. SE in particular and Salmonella was a big ongoing issue. And this is kind of what SE in particular looked like to us. Although we had lab methods to differentiate, we used PFG followed by phage type. Really everything kind of looked like a big blob. It wasn't great for differentiation. And so it was really challenging to investigate. And so because of that, we did outbreak investigations, but they tended to be ones that we epidemiologically identified. So restaurant clusters or issues identified during inspections. But overall, we didn't actually conduct very many outbreak investigations. And overall, generally people involved in this were a bit frustrated by the lab method that we had available to us. But we persevered. And in May of 2017, our world got turned upside down. So phage type and PFG went away. And we had the introduction of whole genome sequencing for all clinical isolates in Canada, including here in BC. Uh, we also had whole genome sequencing started for food isolates connected through the FoodNet Canada site, which is located here in the Fraser Health area, including Burnaby, Chilliwack, and Abbotsford, so food samples collected there, as well as those food samples collected as part of the food quality check or outbreak investigations at our BCCDC public health lab were having whole genome sequencing completed. However, on the animal side of the house, all phase types stopped in August of 2017, and after that, there's been no routine whole genome sequencing on animal isolates or environmental isolates since that time. So although we gained some, we were also losing some typing. So what did that mean for us? And I'm going to try and present, so what has our experience been like over the last 18 months, year and a half, with whole genome sequencing here in BC? I'm going to tell you a few stories of how it has been really beneficial and try and highlight some of the intersectoral work we've done. So this is the frozen breaded chicken experience. I was trying to think of some really catchy names, but it's not. Frozen breaded chicken experience. <laughs> so let's walk through how this story evolves. So on June 1st, our federal partners get whole genome sequencing results. We've now been getting these for about four weeks, so we're all very infant learners here. And they tell us there are five cases that cluster very tightly by whole genome sequencing, zero to one allele, so they're, they're very tight, and they're in three different provinces, including here in BC. By reviewing that initial case information, the hypothesis of frozen breaded chicken products, can everybody figure out what I'm talking about when I say that? Nuggets, strips, burgers, okay, uh, start coming out. So two cases say I ate brand X, and four of those five cases say, well, I, stop at, I shop at grocery store Y, and it's like, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's starting to become compelling. And over time, new cases are reported. We're re-interviewing these cases with a focus on do you eat frozen breaded chicken? What kind? Where did you buy it? And we're collecting loyalty card information. So if you shop place where you use a consumer card, yes, I can access that information with your consent. And I do. <laughs> Up until June 30th, there had been no food samples in this tree. It had just been clinical cases. But on June 30th, a FoodNet Canada sample of brand X nugget matches our clinical cases also by zero to one allele. And everybody goes, at this point, we're up to 11 cases nationally, and almost 90% of them are reporting exposure to frozen breaded chicken, and four of them, not many, but still a significant proportion when you think about recall issues for cases, are saying they consume brand X nugget. So based on the information that we collected epidemiologically over that last month, and in addition to having that food sample that clustered so tightly with the clinical cases, we were able to take immediate action on that product. So, CFIA then met with the company that produced it, and a recall was issued that night. In the end, the outbreak was declared over where there were 13 human cases, only one here in BC, and one food isolate. And that's a very crude visual of what the tree looked like at that time. So you can see how tightly clustered they were. This was both in genetic as well as in time. These cases uh, stopped by the end of, uh, I'm going to say, by the, I think the last case was in early August, probably. So what was unique, what makes this story so great is we would never have identified this cluster without whole genome sequencing. Likely, this cluster would have filled into that large bubble of SE that we had before. And trying to pick those cases out of that bubble would have been next to impossible. But whole genome sequencing provided us a way to differentiate those cases and see them more clearly to investigate. We had strong epidemiological information initially that indicated a possible source in a particular product. And that's really useful. Again, probably the specificity of a lab method helped with that in picking the correct cases to investigate. 
But really, the kicker in this one was having that food sample come through as well. We had a hypothesis, that food sample came through, it matched by whole genome sequencing, it was the brand that we were hypothesizing, really was kind of that nail in the coffin on this investigation. And so having this distinct cluster with whole genome sequencing led to rapid product action. Up until this situation, a frozen breaded chicken product had never been recalled in Canada. So what happened na next? We washed, we rinsed, we repeated this. So for the last year and a half, we've done this now 14 times nationally. BC has had cases in 13 of these investigations. So this has been a large resource intensive process for us over the last year and a half. But I'm gonna tell you it was all worth it because we've had a number of them associated with frozen breaded chicken products. We've had some associated with chicken only and some where uh, both chicken and frozen breaded chicken have been implicated, which kind of makes sense because everybody knows that the frozen breaded chicken comes from chicken, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but really the kicker is 14 times we have done this, 10 times the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has issued a recall for these products. I just said back in June of 2018 that had never happened, but it happens now. And that's a big impact from what a public health investigation can have on immediate public health action. So we should all pat ourselves on the back. We did great immediate action. But what's even better, there's been huge impacts on the industry as a whole. So in a CFI issued this notice in July of 2018. So we had only been doing whole genome sequencing at that time for just over a year. And by that point, it was clearly identified that this was a high risk product. Companies, industry themselves needed to take other steps to mitigate the risk as well as consumer education and such. And so control measures will be in place by April 1st, 2019. Companies will be uh, required to bring salmonella to below detectable amounts. They can do it through a variety of means, but that's the requirement for April of 2019, which is only a few months away. And in some situations, some brands and labels have actually already started to make this change. This is, this is rapid, long-term action. This means that we will potentially not see 14 outbreaks like this going forward in the next year, and that's a big savings for all of us. So that's the first story. This is our Salmonella Brander Up experience, like the Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> so this was in the summer of last year. Once again, our federal partners looked at the whole genome sequencing data and identified a cluster. And this time, there were 20 cases, so quite a few, more than previously. Uh, three provinces, again, implicated, including BC. The interesting thing here was that this cluster showed there was fresh chicken meat and an on-farm chicken sample also in that cluster. And on top of that, there's a link to an ongoing US poultry, live poultry investigation. So we're kind of going in with the impression of, this is probably chicken. I mean, we already have a lot of the evidence we want it to be chicken. We have, we have an outbreak going in another jurisdiction that's probably poultry associated, and we have food and animal isolates. So on August 30th, we now have 30 cases, and fresh chicken meat is by far the most commonly reported exposure. However, Chicken is a frequently, commonly reported exposure amongst our general population. This was higher, but there were other foods that were also coming up higher than we would expect. Things like hot breakfast cereal and frozen berries. And for some investigators, this still kind of felt weird to us, and I felt we wanted to make sure that we were not excluding something because we had all of this information that kind of was already in front of us. Over that period of time, there was a number of pieces of work done, including trace back from restaurant clusters and food samples and lo loyalty card data, which did start to show some commonalities in the trace back and the supply chain for the chicken meat. All again pointing to the likely hypothesis that this is probably a poultry related outbreak, not one specific brand, but likely maybe something that is within the poultry sector and potentially coming through in a variety of different products and we're not able to name it with any specificity. To some investigators, this still felt kind of uncomfortable. So we did a little bit more digging here in BC, and as many of you know, we have an integrated surveillance of foodborne pathogens program. And in that situation, data from the Ministry of Agriculture, the retail collection for Food Net Canada and CPARS, as well as the human isolates are combined. And with the co cooperation of the Ministry of Agriculture, we were able to identify that there had actually been four brander up samples in 2017. But again, there's no whole genome sequencing available for these isolates here in BC. So we said, can we do it? And we were able to. So the Ministry of Agriculture allowed for that work to be done, to be compared to clinical isolates, and our federal colleagues at the National Microbiology Lab <coughs> completed the work on whole genome sequencing. These were all poultry isolates, and it barely clearly showed that two of these isolates matched the clinical cases, and two of those cases did not. For some investigators, 
this was the nail in the coffin. This showed me very, very clearly that there is now local BC chicken samples that have the exact same strain that we are seeing in food samples and human samples with the epidemiological information. These were not samples from the same chicken farm, so it's probably also indicative of the potential that this is a strain that is in our poultry sector, therefore potentially not being able to name a specific chicken product, but that it is multifaceted. So this is what the tree looked like at the end of that one. There were 51 clinical isolates when we uh, ended this investigation. There have actually since been this outbreak concluded, there have been additional clinical isolates in this tree. There were nine food or animal isolates and all of them were chicken, including the two supplied by the BC Minister of Agriculture representing our BC chicken isolates. So what did we learn from this investigation? So requesting additional information on animal environmental isolates can really help add into the weight of evidence in an investigation. While the evidence may have been compelling without those additional BC Ministry of Agriculture isolates to some, it added additional weight and additional understanding to the investigation that was underway. So we learned that we're actually able to in a situation where we do not have routine whole genome sequencing going on. That request can be made and that can be completed when we're in this state of waiting for that to be done routinely. And we've done that again most recently in an investigation of Salmonella and Fantis where nine isolates were whole, genome sequencing, were whole genome sequenced on the request of the investigation team. So what has our experience with whole genome sequencing been like? It's been really positive and it has been a game changer. It's been a lot of work. But what we are realizing is that there is a great level, greater level of specificity for identification of clusters that we did not have before. And when you have that greater level of specificity, you're much more likely to identify source and take rapid action. That's not to say that our restaurant clusters and our inspection issues are just going to go away. We will still identify clusters that way and that's completely inappropriate. But what this also is, is this is an additional tool more specific with greater differentiation in most cases, particularly for Salmonella and Teratitis, that can help identify those clusters that we want to spend time investigating on. The integration of animal and food isolates is highly valuable and it's helpful not just to generate a hypothesis, but it's helpful to confirm a hypothesis and it's helpful to add additional context. I think as we're learning here, the more data we have, the better understanding we can, we can think about it. In some situations, what we have learned is whole genome sequence sequencing validates which, what PFGE would have identified. Whole genome sequencing has been a game changer for, for Salmonella and Teratitis. It has really broken apart that big blob. But for things like the Brander up, that actually was a rare PFGE. PFGE would have been sufficient and it was confirmed by whole genome sequencing. So it's important to remember for all of us that whole genome sequencing is a game changer, but PFGE was also a game changer as well in some situations back in its day, and we're just moving forward now. So where are we now? This is a very crude blob. That blob is now broken out. I have intentionally shown that there are a couple of very big chunks we still have in that circle. This has not broken all of our salmonellas and salmonella enteritis into tiny little pieces of pie. We still have some very big chunks like we had before, but there are now some much more distinct chunks that we have, and in those situations, those are the places where we can now take better action. So where do we go from here? More data, more integration, will improve our understanding. So I, what I will press on all of us here in this room, many of us sit at tables where this is being discussed, is how do we increase the non-human data with whole genome sequencing available to us? It is where we need to go. We have all the clinical data available. We should have just as much of the clinical and monitoring data for the animal and environmental side as possible. Whole genome sequencing is a visual tool. Those trees are visual, but even just discussing what it means. And so we've learned over this last year and a half that coming together both intersectorally as well as laboratory, food safety specialists, and epidemiologists to interpret the data is the best way to do it. But I do believe we are still swimming. We are still in infancy. This is a year and a half into it. We learn new things every time we do this. We spend a lot of time looking at this data and we are making really good progress but we will falter in these processes and we will learn as we go and that's part of it. So, as Dory would say, we should just keep swimming, but don't eat the sushi. <laughs> so, just a big thank you to everyone. This is a very collaborative process that we're undertaking. Uh, these are just a couple of stories of what our experience has been like over the last year and a half. So, uh, thank you to everyone who's been engaged in either providing data or investigating. And that's it. I never did trust those breaded products, <laughs> but I'm really glad you're working on this. Is there any questions for Marsha? 
Stefan. One sec, sorry. Just a quick question, Marsha. Is there any interest in looking at historical data, historical chicken nuggets? Perchance? Because I know the CPARS program for several years did collect chicken nuggets for cross, cross country. So we have an archive of chicken nuggets out there. <laughs> we have archives of everything. You'd be shocked. Yeah, there was a historical, they called it the Retro 1000 that the NML did, which included a mostly outbreak isolates, which would have included food isolates, as well as other historical, primarily clinical isolates. I, I think some of the historical isolates from CPARS and FoodNet have also been done. My guess is as this becomes more routine, we would like to go back and build the database up. The more data we have, the better comparators we have. Oh, it's okay. I know we have two. Sorry, it's me again. Uh, I'm wondering if your lab has considered using Molitoff for bacterial identification. Molitoff MS, it's a mass spectrometry, looks at proteins. It's, it's, it's appealing to uh, adolescent teenagers because it blasts things with a laser and watches the time of flight. Identification, but not typing tool. Thank you. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Our next speaker 